morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for our breakfast briefing this morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Lethbridge. I'm the Director of Executive Education and External Relations here at the Business School. Those are my contact details there at the bottom. And as always, we've got speech to text captioning um, so please look out for the chat link the link that's been in the chat at the moment and yeah click that and what you have to do is it's not too technical it'll come up and um, pop up with a new web page and if you just fiddle around with your window sizes you should be able to then ensure that the captions are running alongside the, the um, session this morning um, just a little flag about our future breakfast briefings. It's not technically International Women's Day, but on Wednesday, the 24th of March, um, Lamai and Quarateg, we're going to be looking at women's economic development, the state of play in Wales at the moment, and also focusing in on domestic violence, a key issue that's been a real cause for concern during the pandemic. Um, and then we're also planning a session in April, working to zero carbon, looking at um, reusing furniture and all of that circular economy so exciting breakfast briefings to come. A little notice about our future courses in executive education, Lean Six Sigma del delivered by our wonderful Professor Manish Kumar. Um, such amazing feedback for this programme. Please have a look at our website, contact us. It's a really fantastic yellow and green belt opportunity. Cardiff Business School, um, one of the birthplaces of lean thinking. Also, we've got um, our LBA programme that's running 24th of April to 14th of December. Um, it's designed to be a taster of, of our executive MBA, actually. So, um, you know, if you haven't got the time and energy to do an executive MBA, then why not consider our LBA? Lots of the same deliverers. And um, you can see we look at leadership and professional development with Dr. Sarah Herlow, digital leadership, operations management. So another sneaky peek with Manish. Um, high performing teams with Richard, HR and performance management, finance for non-financial managers, and then fin finishing off with strategic management with Professor Rob Morgan. So it's a fantastic programme. Do get in touch if that's of interest. And of course, what we really specialise in are bespoke executive education opportunities. So the business school is full, bursting with brilliant researchers, brilliant teachers. So just get in touch if there's something that you want to know about and we can design a course just for you. Also a little flag for our um, spring school, we've got two dedicated executive education days. So that's the 19th and 20th of April, where lots of our lecturers are going to be giving taster sessions, so an hour free as well, um, of their expertise, looking at marketing analytics, organisational and governance issues, humour at work, I think that would be a really exciting one, effective collaboration with Dr Jane Lynch, leadership with political awareness from Dr Catherine Farrell, and then Manish is going to be focusing in on the integration between Lean and Industry 4.0. So lots of things to look out for there. Um, this meeting is being recorded. Um, you should have found the Q&A button. Some, most of the time it's on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Sometimes it pops up at the top. But yeah, if you've got any questions to pose to Will, then now's your opportunity and um, it'll be open. And we're trying something new, actually. Usually um, you can't see the questions that other people have posed. But yeah, this time you'll be able to vote for which questions you like. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and yeah, you can follow Will as well on Twitter um, because he's a really interesting follow. Um, me, political editor at Media Wales and this is the book that you've written Will, Lockdown Wales, I think someone's going to post a link about how to buy it as well in the chat or I might do in a minute. So now over to you Will and we're interested to hear your perspectives on the awakening of Wales's devolved consciousness. So thanks ever so much for joining us this morning. Thanks very much, Sarah. I should start by saying I had a full, wonderful script written and then I was the victim of a corrupted pen drive this morning. So I'm oh, going to be nice. speaking from, it's OK, I'm going to be speaking from my notes. So forgive me if I'm not as fluent as uh, I hoped I'd be. Um, so my name is Will Haywood. I'm the acting political editor at Wales Online um, and I'm in this role as maternity cover. And I started um, almost exactly a year ago. It was about, uh, it was a week before we went into lockdown, I think. Um, and it's been a it's been a pretty eventful year. So I've covered... Um, uh, all the Welsh Government press conferences, um, the Downing Street press conference, um, interviewed the First Minister in Vaughan Geffing several times over this period, and um, I, I also wrote the book, and thank you so much for sharing it. it means my publisher will be nice to me. Um, so this time last year, it was about six weeks before I started the role, and I had to um, 
have, I had a chat with our editor in chief and we were thinking about how are we going to cover Welsh politics over the next year? And we discussed stories that we might look at. And COVID was a story. It was just a story. It wasn't the story. And I mean, that was six weeks before we went into lockdown. And the thing we were talking about most was how on earth do we get people to read stories about Welsh politics? We can measure so much. And um, we know in terms of analytics for our um, stories, and um, we knew that people just had no appetite for Welsh politi political stories in, in, in any sufficient numbers. Um, most people couldn't tell you who Mark Drakeford was. Um, so we're thinking, right, how are we going to cover this? We could cover lots on flooding. There's some um, huge issues around the M4. Um, these are all essentially political stories. And um, little did we know, we wouldn't have to go looking for any, really. <laughs> it would, um, they'd all be coming to us and there'd be an insatiable appetite for what the Welsh Government had to say, which, uh, believe me, is quite a change from where we were uh, before. So um, I got ready for um, the pandemic, um, for um, the job. Um, got all my security clearances for Westminster and um, the Senate. Um, I was excited to go for a drinks reception in Downing Street. I thought I'd be going to, and it turns out I've done the entire job from within this room. Um, which is a shame. I didn't even get invited to the uh, the drinks parties in the Senate, the illegal drinks parties, which could have been fun. So uh, that was very disappointing. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief overview today of the awakening of Wales's devolved consciousness. Now, I'm, I'm not an academic. I'm not a constitutional expert. I can just talk you through the observations I've made and how devolution has changed in terms of perception and people's interest in it. Um, so let's start by what this means whale is the awakening of whales is devolved consciousness so i'm i'm trained to um <laughs> put things in very simple terms um, um if i was to go into the newsroom and say to my editor i'd really like to write an article about whales is devolved consciousness and uh, i'd probably get laughed out of the of the room back when we used to be in rooms together obviously um but basically i think this means are people and politicians in wales are more aware of devolution they were? Are they more aware of how it affects their daily lives? And are they more aware of their feelings towards it? And have those feelings changed? Um, I realise saying that I've actually made people and politicians different, which is incredibly rude of me. So I, I know there's a few uh, politicians, former politicians attending today. So my apologies for that. Um, one thing I would say um, is I'm going to do a very brief overview today. I would much rather you guys ask questions. You know what you want to know far better than I do. So I'm going to uh, skirt over a few topics and hopefully that will uh, um, make you keen to ask some questions and we can have a proper Q&A at the end. So Wales is devolved consciousness. Are people more aware of it now? I think the answer is unequivocally yes. Um, I think COVID has dramatically changed how uh, devolution is perceived in Wales. And I think a really good example for that to start with is we look at the contrasts between now and a year ago. So if we go back to that first lockdown and um, putting aside all the disastrous political decisions which were made between the middle of January and March the 21st, we can discuss them more in uh, the questions if you like. Um, but if we think back to this time last year, uh, so end of February, we we knew a, a storm was coming and um, we'd seen um, what didn't mean we necessarily prepared for it, but we knew this storm was coming. We saw what was happening in Italy and then later Spain, and we knew that something very bad was coming down the chute. But the idea that Wales would do something different then was kind of unthinkable. And I don't mean unthinkable as in people thinking, oh, Wales couldn't go its own way. I mean unthinkable as in it wasn't really considered that we could do something different to other parts of the UK. It just wasn't really something that most people kind of conceived of. Um, so Wales went into lockdown really led by the UK government. I'm sure you're the same as me. You, you sat around and we all watched those Downing Street press conferences with Boris Johnson, usually flanked by Chris Whitty and Sir Patrick Valance. Um, and we, that was what was going to happen. What was said in that press conference was what mattered to us. It, what was said by Mark Drakeford and Vaughan Geffen was really secondary. Um, I mean, we saw that with um, the um, hesitation for them to flex their muscles to cancel the Wales-Scotland game, and it eventually got cancelled, but only once lots of people from Scotland had flown <laughs> to Wales and were staying in Cardiff. But, I mean, who knows what the death toll would have been if that had actually been allowed to go ahead. But there was this, there was this assumption back then that the, well, the UK government would lead. It, it was just ingrained. And now let's compare that to the current lifting of the lockdown or when we the firebreak was imposed back in the autumn. Now, um, they did the firebreak, I think, I think even they would agree they did the firebreak a bit late and they didn't do it for long enough. Um, although they did do it 
significantly before England. Um, but that demonstrated a confidence, I think, that just wouldn't have been there then. The idea that Wales would go ahead without England, well, without the UK government, um, we'll come more onto that um, later. I mean, that's a space of six months, and that is a huge change. I mean, these are things that often take decades of um, uh, custom and um, habit to almost entrench. And actually, we saw in the space of six months that the First Minister was prepared to take Wales into a huge lockdown, um, which is which is a big... I mean, I, mean, I didn't know what really a lockdown was this time last year um, in, in any real sense. Um, and if we look at now, um, we've seen that Boris Johnson has announced a very comprehensive timetable um, over the next uh, four, four months, which has got very concrete dates on this is when gyms will open, this is when hospitality will open. And in Wales, we just simply haven't done that. And that's not to say the merits of either strategy, but they are distinctly different. Um, and I think that is that is quite a, a big change. And for, for example, from my, my day to day, we used to live blog, live tweet, cover, um, attend, all of the Downing Street press conferences religiously. Uh, we dedicate, we promoted the, them beforehand. Um, we, it, it was something we were very, very, um, it was a big part, of, we planned our day around it. Now, I don't sometimes always watch um, the pre, uh, Downing Street press conference live. I'll always come across what's um, happened, but w there's been a real drop in interest in them within Wales, essentially because people are realizing that what's said in the Welsh government press conference will have more of a direct impact on their lives. Now, when we talk about Wales kind of going its own way, I think we need to have, have two disclaimers, which we can link to the current set of rules. So the first is the furlough scheme. Um, Wales is more dependent on the furlough scheme than any other part of the UK, um, in part because we have quite a, lot, a lot, proportionally larger manufacturing base and uh, you can't really work from home uh, in manufacturing. You can't run a production line through a living room. Um, and that really does hinder how far the Welsh government can go from what's happening in England because if um, Rishi Sunak, um, if Boris Johnson decides to reopen hospitality, for instance, um, in mid March, um, we've seen in the in the autumn around the fire break when Wales went into the fire break that England didn't. There wasn't an appetite in um, from the Treasury for uh, to extend furlough because Wales had made this political decision. It was only once England went into a lockdown that we saw furlough bin. Um, extended and that um, massively limits what the uh, we can do here in Wales um, what, the, what the Welsh government can do um, because they can't um, uh, fund the furlough scheme themselves they don't have the, anywhere near the financial firepower to do that so they are constrict there are still constraints on on that and I think there's also the links between England and Wales um, just geographically so in Scotland you've got this very you've got a much narrower border than we've got um, but it's also much less well populated whereas in England we've uh, in, between England and Wales we've got a very porous border with some people being educated on one side of the border living on the other they might have the doctors on one side you know it's it's quite um it's very um interlinked and we saw this um in uh, just after Christmas so the cases in North Wales especially Denbyshire, Flintshire, Wrexham took a very, very long time to come down compared to the other parts of Wales. And this was weird because Wales had been in lockdown for over three weeks and we weren't necessarily seeing um, declines in North East Wales, which is weird because normally you would have seen it by that point. And actually, um, the uh, epidemiologists who are far more informed on this than I am say that this was actually because England took a, a longer to go into lockdown. And there's such strong links between the northeast of Wales and the northwest of England. that Actually, that took some time to change. So obviously, Wales is not operating in a vacuum. So it does limit how um, much the Welsh government can go its own way. But I don't think that takes away from the point I'm making that there has been a huge shift. Um, this brings me on to um, Mark Drakeford himself. Um, this crisis has been amazing for him personally in terms of his profile. Um, mainly because people now know who the hell he is, um, which is uh, obviously a bit of a boon for him. Um, we measure traffic on our stories. Excuse me. We measure traffic on our stories and we've got this down to a fine art. We know exactly what will generate traffic and engagement in our site. We know how long are people are staying on it and we know at what point they leave the story. And um, we, I can tell you that if we had put and we also know, especially what works well in headlines. And if we had put the name Mark Drakeford 
or Vaughan Geffing or Welsh government in a headline before mid-March, it would absolutely kill the story. Um, it, you, you would deliberately not include them because people just wouldn't read it. Um, and what that is, the change in that has been enormous. Adding Mark Drakeford's name to a headline is now a real boon to that story in terms of the people that view it. Um, so, for example, I do a Facebook Live with um, uh, the First Minister every month or so, and we get 250,000 people will watch that Facebook Live. Um, and that's that's significantly more than lots of our rugby coverage. And we've rugby is one of our biggest and, and most read um, items. And following those Facebook lives, I'll then write a story on that. And that will get probably another 250,000 um, views. And that I mean, you're talking like half a million people. It's a significant percentage of the three million in Wales, especially considering a lot of them are children. <laughs> um, and so he has become a lot more prominent. and. I think the development of a prominent leader within Wales is a key part of that devolved consciousness we're talking about. Um, so when I say popular, I'm not talking about Drakeford himself being a popular figure, although he is, polls suggest he's one of Welsh Labour's main assets going into the, the election. But I'm talking about the popularity of his press conferences. Um, I think part of this is because it is quite a juxtaposition. If you see a Mark Drakeford press conference, the UK government press conference, um, his style of oratory, the way he approaches questions is very, very different. We can explore that more in, in, the, uh, in the questions if, if you wish. Um, but I think it's not necessarily just about the press conferences themselves. It's the fact that what he's saying now has a direct impact on people's lives. Um, people get turned off from politics for a whole host of reasons. And believe me, covering politics for a year, I have never been more turned off by politics. Um, one thing that makes people very more likely to turn on to politics is when they feel like what has been said is directly relevant to their lives. And I mean, what he has been doing this year, he's a man who can now say whether you can visit your mum in a care home. He's a man who can say how and when your kids are going to be educated and assessed in examinations. Um, and he can affect whether you what he says affects whether you lose your job and it can affect whether you go for a pint. Do you remember pints? I, I miss pints. Um, and to me, that is that is the awakening of the devolved consciousness that people realize that decisions made by devolved ministers and politicians are directly affecting their lives. And I don't think that is a, a genie that's going to go back in the bottle. And I think there will be some permanence to that. Um, interestingly, Drakeford himself wasn't, didn't necessarily court this. He was a very big fan of the form nation approach, um, but it, it hasn't worked out like that for a variety of reasons of which again, um, put questions in there um, if, you, if you want to talk about them. Um, I think all this has to come with another disclaimer, though, um, about how far this actually reaches. Um, how much do people in Wales actually understand about devolution and how much do they just know Oh, that's Vaughan Gething and Mark Drakeford? Um, I'm guessing that even I'm th very well informed and politically aware people here. I mean, how many of the Welsh cabinet could you realistically name? Um, I, it's um, I, I wouldn't say it's an entrenched that people are fully invested in the institution. So, for example, people know Rishi Sunak, is the, but they also know the, the role of Chancellor of the Exchequer. And I don't think people will necessarily have the same affinity to the Welsh institutions, because I think those things do take time to entrench. And uh, we will probably see that grow more as um, younger people who have grown up only under devolution um, come into um, voting age. Um, so. I think. If we're talking about, um, sorry, this is a very whistle-stop tour, but I do want to get to the questions. I see there's some great ones in there. Um, um, if I think the awakening of the devolved consciousness has in part been driven by people have become a little bit more aware of how things work in the UK. And I think it, it's, it's also made people aware of how crap the system is that we've got right now. Um, whatever your political allegiance, um, whether you're uh, an ardent um, uh, supporter of an independent Wales or you want to abolish the assembly or as most people are, you lie in between those two poles. Um, I don't think you can look at the system right now and say that it works. Um, um, let's take, for instance, um, Boris Johnson. Uh, he is the prime minister of the UK, um, but he also kind of also doubles as the prime minister of England. Um, so, I mean, as an equivalent, this is like the president of the United States also been the governor of Texas. Um, this isn't going to work because there are conflicts of interest there. And it, it, it's just it's too much. So you end up with almost the worst of both worlds where um, for um, 
people all across the UK, not just in Wales and Scotland. So people in England are obviously massively underrepresented. They're far less represented, really, than people in Wales um, uh, because their prime minister is also the prime minister of the UK. Um, and, and this just doesn't work. I mean, we saw this when um, Mark Drakeford and um, Boris Johnson didn't speak any time uh, on the phone, uh, on Zoom at all, not a conversation between the end of May and the start of September. And that's madness. Um, I mean, I don't think anyone can say that is a functioning um, bureaucracy. So I think people have become aware that things don't necessarily work that well. I mean, you've got um, people drawing from the same evidence base who are drawing quite significantly different conclusions lots of the time uh, in terms of devolved nations. I mean, uh, the diversion has been fairly limited in the grand scheme of things, but they have drawn quite different conclusions. And um, it, it, that isn't always ideal, especially when um, the rules in different areas will actually directly conflict with each other. So um, I, I, I think that's um, that's something that we need to be aware of. And I think people have become more aware of how the system isn't necessarily working because of this crisis. And I think awareness that the system isn't working is actually an awakening of a devolved consciousness. That was fairly rambly. That's the bit where I missed the script. Um, so I think as an example of the complications of it. So um, third week of the first lockdown. So mid-April, I did a story on uh, outbreaks in Welsh prisons. And there was a huge um, uh, upsurge in cases within prisons in Wales. Um, the, the thing with that was you want to look at who is responsible for this. Now, prisons in Wales are not devolved. It's, they're run by, um, by the MOJ, uh, Ministry of Justice. And that, um, apart from Park, which is run by G4S, but let's not go into that. Um, and but the healthcare in prisons is actually run by the Welsh government. So that is devolved. So you've got the prisons which are run by the UK government, but healthcare in prisons, which is run by the Welsh government in the middle of a pandemic. That is quite a, a, that's a crazy situation, which involves, if that is to work, and it can, of course, work, it involves huge levels of cooperation, but also really robust uh, mechanisms and structures. And that they are, uh, frankly, they're not there. And I think and aware, people are becoming more aware of this. They might not know that prison's example, but they are aware that the system isn't necessarily working, which again, as I say, is a awakening of a devolved consciousness. Um, a thing I want to touch on is um, the media. Um, and it, I am drawing to an end, I promise you, after asking you to send in all these questions and then I'm just not letting you ask them. Um, so I've spent hours and hours of the last, well, days of the last uh, year explaining, um, essentially just repeating that, this doesn't apply to Wales. That's been a, a huge thing that I've had to do. And I know all my colleagues in Welsh media um, have had to spend a lot of time saying, look, this isn't, this doesn't apply to Wales. And it is, I mean, let's take an example. It was mid-May, uh, um, sorry, first week in May. I think it was the 8th off the top of my head. Um, and uh, England was opening up and reducing, um, uh, taking away the travel restrictions. And Boris Johnson, Prime Minister said, drive as far as you want, drive to a beach. Um, now, obviously, that has implications for people in England who now feel they can travel to Wales because people in England aren't necessarily aware of devolution. And that is something we should also talk about. But um, if you live in Wales, so say you're a person, you live in Murfordshire and you're you voted Conservative at the last election and you watch the news at 10 on the TV, but you turn off before the local news and you buy a newspaper like, um, which is primarily based in London. You're going to see the person you voted for telling you, I can drive, you can drive as far as you want. You're going to go on the news and you're going to see, you can now drive as far as you want. You're going to open the newspaper and it will say reopening. I mean, I, at first I'm outraged that they're not reading Wales online, but also it's completely understandable why that person would then be confused by that. Um, but I think this has actually started to change. I think people are far, far more aware now of the rules that they need to, act, that there are different rules. And that is the definition of awakening of a devolved consciousness. Um, there has been a big change within the media. I've got friends and colleagues who I know in um, uh, all across um, the um, media, which is primarily based in England. And um, it, there, there has been a change. I mean, the Welsh government, actually, I spoke to the um, one of the comms people in the Welsh government, and they said that um, they think the change came after um, we had those scenes where Welsh beaches were quiet and English beaches were absolutely packed. And actually, that it, it, it's almost like suddenly people woke up to the fact that devolution has been going for 20 <laughs> over 20 years. Um, um, I think just to point out a reason why um, we've seen a, an increase in um, 
Uh, another example of how Wales, the Welsh government and the Senate have necessarily become a bit more prominent is the rise of disinformation around them. So we've got misinformation and disinformation. So misinformation happens all the time. It is um, information which is misleading and not correct, but not created with the intent of causing um, uh, sowing distrust. Like I, I used to, when I was a trainee reporter, I used to go to crime scenes a lot. Quite often somebody will have just collapsed and had a heart attack. But someone, member of the public, go, oh, I've heard it's terrorism. It's definitely terrorism or uh, it was a stabbing. It was a gangland stabbing. And that's just misinformation. That, that's just how whispers happen. And people, it's what happens when people are scared. And we've seen a lot of that during the crisis. But there's also disinformation, which is a bit more targeted. Um, things like um, 5G, I mean, vaccines. Um, and um, we've seen a lot of that directed at the Welsh government. And um, that tends to be when you are becoming prominent. When you have it, when you're relevant and when you matter, you tend to have disinformation directed at you. Um, I, I actually had my own um, bit of disinformation directed at me recently. And um, this is not to say I think I'm relevant and matter. But um, uh, we got uh, an email to our news desk of somebody saying um, uh, to, to, to the edit, one of the editors there, you are aware that um, uh, Mark Drakeford is Will Hayward's uncle. And <laughs> I got a message from um, the editor going, Mark Drakeford's not your uncle, is he? I was like, what? No, <laughs> no, uh, not not even slightly. And um, I got another email from someone going, "Are you aware that? And um, can you confirm that Mark Drakeford is in fact your uncle?" And it's just weird how these these things start, and they they're usually aimed at discrediting um, institutions that essentially safeguard democracy in the UK. Um, I just want to finish by saying, when I say Wales is devolved consciousness, I'm not meaning that every person in Wales is massively on board with devolution. Actually, far from it. Um, people might be more aware of devolution, but not like what they hear. I mean, polls say that abolish the assembly, which is a funny name for a political party, considering the assembly doesn't exist. But abolish the assembly are on course to win seats at the next election. But actually, to me, that does speak to people being more aware of devolution. I mean, it also, to me, suggests that they're not fully across what devolution can mean. But that's that's debate for another day, maybe. But people are much more aware of the Senate and devolution. And... Uh, I think that, um, I mean, I could talk about the crisis itself in more detail, but I'd much rather um, get to your questions. So if that wasn't far too rambling, I'm going to go back to Sarah to uh, ask some questions. Thanks, Will. Um, yeah, the top question is, what are your thoughts on the momentum that seems to be building for an independent Wales? That's from our friend Adrian Coles at, at NatWest. <laughs> um, OK, do I want to pull up the Welsh independence thread on a thing that's going to be put out live? Um, yes, why not? Um, so... Um, Welsh independence, um, I think, has been, although there's there's a very passionate um, amount of people uh, who are in favour of Welsh independence, I actually think Welsh independence recently has been driven primarily by unionists and mismanagement of the union. Um, I think um, there's a, a very strong argument, but um, when the home, until the home nations get as much attention as the home counties, <laughs> support for independence is naturally going to grow. Um, I think there's, um, uh, I can totally understand why people um, see independence as a, uh, a vehicle for change, because as I say, people have noticed that there is, um, uh, that the system doesn't necessarily work in an optimal way. And when people see that, people do want to change things and independence um, uh, can be put forward as a, an alternative to that. Um, I think one caveat I would say about the growth in support of independence I'm not saying my opinion on it at all. I wish I had an opinion on it. I think it's a very complicated issue, um, uh, which deserves more attention. Um, I, I think that although support for independence has risen, um, and polls suggest it is pretty much as high now as it's been since they were doing polls, um, I think it's worth acknowledging how important it is to people. So, for instance, the vast majority of people are in favour of House of Lords reform, but that doesn't mean the Lib Dems sweep to power in a glorious general election on the back of that policy. Um, how much people something matters to people is um, uh, a big part of it. I mean, most people actually before the EU referendum didn't care about the EU. It was it didn't poll as anywhere close to things like crime, the NHS, um, when it, in terms of elections, but one you give people an either or that's that's the only decision there's a decision to make um so yeah i think um i think it's i can it's a very obvious why there's been a rise in independence i think 
Um, we need to, it will be something that won't, again, it's like devolution. It's not going to be a genie that goes back in the bottle. It will always be a conversation that's going to be had. It has become a lot more mainstream. And I'm sorry if that uh, didn't fully answer your question. Well, thanks, Will. Um, next one from Kerry Lynn Pike. I'm going to merge it with another one as well. What are your thoughts on how the UK media now handles and reports on devolved issues, particularly as the four governments' approaches diverged? I know the in England complaint is still a constant refrain on Twitter, but has it um, improved? And yeah, another question. To what extent has reporting by the UK confused or held back Wales' devolved consciousness? So yeah, could you talk more about that English media um, dimension, please? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm, I'm always super, super hesitant to talk about the media in generalities, because this means a blogger in his mom's basement. And this means the Financial Times. This means the Daily Mail. This means, um, you know, the New York Times, Wales Online. This is a huge this is this is a huge spectrum. And I think um, if we, when we talk about the media, we're almost guilty of what we're accusing the media of doing when they talk about devolution. They're just speaking in general generalities. But I'm going to speak in generalities. Um, um, I think it has, I think it's come as a surprise to certain elements of um, the media that how the devolution actually exists. And it's it's not just um, a kind of a, a little kind of side project. Um, the analogy I used to saw in the newsroom recently it was like, you've got an uncle who you don't see very often and you see them when you're 14 and then the next time you see them, you're in your 20s and they're shocked that you can drive and have a job and have a like a partner and they're like oh gosh, well, you're driving now are you and it, it almost feels like that's what's happened with that like, oh, things are happening differently over there I do think that um the consumption the, the lack of acknowledgement of devolution and devolved issues before the crisis has absolutely made it harder for people's awareness of devolution to entrench and um, I think I think that's true but I, I also think that um these things do take a very long time um it takes i mean well, well as i said in the when i was talking once people have lived within a, um, a devolved wales and grown up in a devolved wales they're far more comfortable with the idea that that happened that that is a thing um if you're um the devolution's been around for 20 years if you're 80 um only a quarter of your life has this existed and all your formative years this wasn't even a thing so you, i can understand why that happens i do think the media has um improved over the course of the crisis i think there's an acknowledgement i mean you'll still have um certain media um news outlets which will have a political slant which will um it's almost within their uh they might have a desire to underplay the value of devolution um, um and that's a political that's a political slant um but uh, yeah, I, I think they've i think it's massively improved i think it's come a long way in a short period of time but i think there's a long way still to go so and i yes i do think it's hindered um especially before the crisis um uh, uh devolution and stuart cole picks up you know that there are some really quite disparaging views um expressed of welsh people by he mentions aa gill um Anne robinson max hastings um how do you think that welsh media could sort of better respond to those sort of um yeah, taunts, I suppose. Well, I, I think I'm not sure it's entirely the job of the Welsh media to respond to what Anne Robinson or Gill thinks, because I I, I mean, I, I, I think the best thing Welsh media can do is provide a really good comprehensive um, coverage of issue, Welsh issues and what's happening to people in Wales. And that isn't just politics. That's telling human interest stories. That's that's telling the stories of people in Wales. And entertaining, informing and um, engaging with the people in Wales who are their readers. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm always hesitant. To, I mean, when people, it's, I mean, I, I think there's, there are there are jokes, but there's also things which it's just lazy, isn't it? It's just lazy reporting and lazy taunts. And I don't almost want to spend hours and hours rebutting these people because like I don't, the guy who shouts swear words at me on the street, I don't spend lots of my life responding to him because it's beneath, I'd rather do what we do well and I think people in Wales are mature enough to be able to ride above that I mean it's very I understand people feeling personally attacked by it because actually it's a personal attack <laughs> so I don't blame people for doing it but um, I think the best thing the Welsh media can do is be a really good provider of news in Wales and also frame UK issues in a Welsh context for people in Wales I think if it, doing those things are the best rebuttal we as the media, again, that is a huge thing. If when I write columns, I'm totally diff 
different and I, I, I love a rock. But um, in terms of our day to day things, which the bread and butter that actually change stuff, I think we're better off doing a very good job at reporting issues in Wales. So Media Wales is a business, isn't it? And um, yeah, can you tell us about that sort of business journey through throughout the pandemic? How have things changed in Media Wales? Um, well, I mean, so Media Wales includes Wales Online, the Western Mail, South Wales Echo, um, loads of Valley titles, the Evening Post. Um, and it's been it's been quite interesting for us. So we get measured on um, uh, I, I personally get measured on clicks. Um, that's one one measurement I have on what's successful. Um, we have um, when we used to be in a the newsroom, there's plasma screens all around the newsrooms with the articles which are most read. Several times a day we get um, loads of data sent to us on what our stories did, how long people were on it, where people were coming to the story from, what links they were leaving that story to go to. And it, we've got it down to a fine art, really. And one thing I would say is we get measured on clicks, but over the last kind of two, three years as an organisation, we've focused as much on engagement time. So that's how long people are on an article. So for us, I'm um, if, if somebody um, I, I've used this example, so if some people speak to me before and they've heard this example before, but say we put something on our Facebook, which is just it's just designed to get instant traffic. So it's like our oh, Audi have launched a new five litre bottle of Prosecco, which frankly sounds awesome right now. Um, but that will get, say, a million views. But that's a million views that come into our site and they leave. They don't make us our regular news provider of Audi based Prosecco like that's views that have gone. If people, but what our data shows, if people come to our stories and they spend over a minute on a story, and a minute is a very long time to spend on an online news article, they are much more likely, like by an order of magnitude, to make us their regular news provider. And if, um, say, I write a story which is very, it's lots of, it gets really long reads, it's a real insightful piece of journalism, and 10,000 people read that. So much, much, much less. Um, so 1% of the, um, 1%? 1% of the, um, the Audi uh, um, article. Um, if those 10,000 people then think, well, this is a really good news writer and make, and make us their daily, and they come five times a day, every day, that suddenly has made, a, that's made much more traffic than the Prosecco article, but it's also um, made us not as um, uh, subjective to slow news days. And it means we can invest time in more of this stuff. And this is what we've tried to do a lot throughout the crisis is I, I, I mean, I would blur and but I think we've done a really good job in providing day to day coverage of this is what the rules are. This is what you need to do. And it's better. I mean, I wrote a piece on the rules um, like this is how the rules are different in Wales and England. And it got one point two million people read it. I mean, that's over a third of Wales. So I think we've done that very well. Um, and we've also um, tried to do longer pieces like we did. We broke the stories about care homes um, and the um, people being uh, discharged from hospital into care homes. So. For us, it's been very much the, the better quality we do, the better we do, which I think five or six years ago, online journalism was in a very different place um, because it, it's a real art form getting people to read stuff online. There's a lot of noise there. And I think it's something we've developed. Um, so I've realised I've just blown our own trumpet for five minutes there. So go on to another place. It's fair enough. I'm so interested in the fact that, you know, you've moved to a loyalty model really and around um you know keeping quality quality and loyalty which yeah, is, and the, the, yeah the thing i would stress there is a place for that um for right for stuff that gets instant views because people people click on stuff because like people might won't click on will click on something once but if it's rubbish they're not going to keep coming back and people are coming back and there is something to be said for writing things people do want to read and i think that's why a lot of news organizations have struggled uh, with the move to digital because it, it's a totally different um form of presenting journalism but sorry just to clarify you've seen wells online become more popular then oh it, i mean we got um in march um sorry april i think we got just under 70 million un um, views on our site and over i think it was over 10 million unique users so that's individuals and then 70 million actual clicks on the site which um uh, when I started, like 25 million was good, um, and I started five years ago. So it's been it's been quite quite a big growth. Great. So someone's um, said this year's been excruciatingly tough. I agree. Um, but spring, there's signs of spring. The days are getting longer. Maybe there's the end is in sight. Um, you've been performing a crucial public service. So thank you. Secondly, how have you and how have you found it all personally? So <laughs> this is how is oh. well. <laughs> uh, I'll make this one really quick because 
I can't imagine anyone cares. Um, uh, I, it's been, without swearing, it's been it's been rubbish, hasn't it? I mean, it's been rubbish for all of us. Um, we went through, we had like quite a few, we had, well, we had some redundancies back in summer, which is always awful. Um, but I can't complain. I have a job. Um, I live on my own, which is quite hard, but um, I have a, a really good family, really good friends. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so I've, I found it hard, but I don't wear PPE all day, every day to do my job. I just, um, I mean, I, I wear board shorts for a lot of the time. So <laughs> let's um, <laughs> let, let's um, not, uh, I, I don't want to, um, uh, to moan too much, but yeah, it, it's been, it's been awful. And I think, I think the hard thing is, because I've got a public facing role, I get a lot of, um, I mean, I, I get a lot, there's lots of trolls, there's lots of abusive messages and I'm, I'm white, straight <laughs> and a bloke. So I can't imagine what some of my colleagues get. So um, yeah, it, it's been tough, but it could have been lots of Okay, thanks. A couple of questions here actually about um, the Welsh government press conferences. Could you talk a bit about the style and, you know, how different they are to Boris, you know, next slide, please, witty affairs. <laughs> next slide, please. And the slides are just awful <laughs> because unless you've got like a degree in statistics, quite often it's very hard to interpret them very quickly. And obviously the point of those things to inform, and um, that's just my view, I, I just get annoyed at bad slides. Um, the thing I'd say about the Welsh Government press conferences, I'm always really conscious of um, how we approach them because um, there's there's a real belief that to hold a politician account you need to be very finger pointy call them out yeah call them out um it's you hear it all the time like failing to call them out and there, there is absolutely a place for that especially when a politician has been evasive but you've also i'm in a really privileged position and something that me and my colleagues are really aware of when we stand there this guy i'm talking to unfortunately he's not only a guy i'm talking to has the power to stop people leaving their homes for anything other than exercise that is a huge huge amount of power that person has and there's a lot of people that would like to ask a lot of questions of him and we really do feel that weight of pressure that we need to ask a question we need people who are watching this to leave this press conference feeling more informed about this virus that's killing them sure on that to do it and you want to call that person out and say you're not doing this well but actually sometimes people just want to know am i allowed to visit my mom if she's dying <laughs> or um what so I've got four kids we live in a flat we've got one laptop you know is any support coming in terms of IT so and I think what I try and do we try and do with those press conferences is we always try to ask them we ask questions like can you explain and that's one thing you can say for Mark Drakeford he's he does try and explain you can tell he was a public policy lecturer no offense to all the lecturers on this but like sometimes the issue is he uh, he goes on too long <laughs> um and I think that's that's been that is a difference, I think, from both the politicians and the journalists, maybe, um, because there is a, there's a pressure on us also to be. I mean, if I ask a question, which is asking to explain something, the amount of emails I get saying, oh, why didn't you have a go at him? And I'm like, well, because I know what he's going to say. And someone like Drakeford, they shut down as soon as you're combative. But actually, for instance, with Vaughan Gethin, the best thing to do is asking is almost give him enough rope over care homes. He said, I think some quite. Um, he made some missteps in those press conferences when he was talking about care homes and discharges from care homes. And we didn't have the gotcha moment in the press conference, but he said enough that we were then able to go and do an investigation, which showed that they hadn't handled it very well. And it was because we let them talk. Um, I, I think, I mean, I get, there, there's always a temptation to kind of almost caught Twitter. It, like there's been times when I've challenged, been very much more challenging in the Welsh government press conferences. I've got loads of love from people going, oh, this is, this is really, yeah, yeah, you really held them to account nobody left that press conference any more informed they just was me going oh. and there's never been a more opportunities for you to have a go at politicians if someone wants to do it they've got a facebook they've got twitter they've got emails you can send them letters you can even ring them like if people want to have a go at politicians they can and i don't think that's the role this that i don't think that's the overarching role of a responsible journalist during a pandemic i think you need to leave people more informed about what's the virus that's killing them um and i don't i i think i think it's hard when you're interviewing certain politicians, especially within the current cabinet, who are almost genetically made up to be a bit more evasive, I think. Um, I, I think that's 
Okay, well, I'll ask you to explain this one, please, Will, then. To what extent do you think that Wales Online should bear some of the blame for the lack of understanding of devolution amongst the Welsh public? Just this week, they ran a story headlined, All Your Travel Questions Answered After Boris Johnson's Announcement, clearly syndicated for English news outlets to the chagrin of readers in Wales who could see it as helpful and unhelpful and misleading. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know, it's fair enough. It's a fair enough question to ask. Um, well, I, I wasn't across that particular story, but um, I could tell you um, we have um, a we have a central team which writes stories which are optimised for web, and that goes on to all the reach sites. So that sites all over the UK. It's quite often the bane of my life because um, sometimes that's not as clear as we'd want it to be. In that particular story, um, yes, Wales and I did write a story about Boris Johnson. The questions answered about overseas travel, but the thing to say is. That is hugely within the role of the prime minister. The Welsh government has very, very little role in what happens with holidays. Um, they can say don't travel, but vast majority of people don't fly from Welsh airports. They, they just don't. Um, so most people are traveling from England. The biggest decider is not actually the UK government or the Welsh government, it's the country of which you're traveling to. That's one of the biggest impacts on where you go on holiday and what the rules are and whether you can go. And that is completely within the role of the UK government to make those negotiations. So I think on that particular point, I think it was, it is, I think it works to talk about it from, because Boris Johnson is still the prime minister in Wales as well. So I don't think not mentioning him, uh, I think it would be almost disingenuous not to. In terms of the blame for people not being more aware of devolution. I mean, I we when we first started, we wrote a lot of stories about, oh, this is what's happening today in the Senate. This is what's happening in this Senev committee. And no one reads them. I mean, I would consider a story to have flopped if it got under 5,000 people reading, especially if it's gone on our Facebook. But we would get 80 people reading that. I mean, there was almost as many people in the committees as were reading the stories about the committees. So what we've done is we've changed a little bit how we cover stuff like that. Like I've watched or read the transcripts to every single Welsh committee meeting this year, and there's six or seven a week and they've gone for two hours. It's it's a real undertaking. But if I'm say there's a press, press conference where they talk about um, a um, committee meeting where they talk about domestic violence, huge issue. If it was um, terrorism, if well, as many people, women were getting killed in terrorist attacks, they'd be round the clock Cobra meetings, but apparently because it's by partners, it just doesn't get the coverage it deserves. That's a really big issue. And it was covered in a um, committee. In the committee, one of the people in the committee said, um, um, one of the politicians said, oh, there's, um, uh, I think, 80% of refugees, don't quote me on the figures, but say 80% of refugees have got waiting lists and are turning women away. The fact that that politician says it is not a story. A politician saying something, and I've explained this to lots of politicians this year, because they say something that isn't, doesn't mean anything. The story is those women who are being turned away at the refuges. So what we would do is we'd approach a refuge and we'd say we'd like to speak to women, to, uh, um, happy to keep anonymous, but to understand that issue. And that leaves people in Wales far more, with far more insight into that issue than this politician said X. Politicians have got lots of ways that they can communicate with the public and it's, we're not there to be a mouthpiece for politicians. Um, I think there's always ways you can be broader in terms of people being aware of devolution. We always need to be on our guard that we are being very clear on what distinguishes um, Welsh issues and UK issues. I think that's absolutely correct. Um, I don't think that, um, I think it would be uh, quite clumsy to suggest that we in particular are to blame for a lack of um, uh, insight in Wales, but obviously we can always improve. But I think there's, we, our job isn't to educate people on the minutiae of how the Senev works. It, it just, that, that isn't, our job is to tell people, inform people of stories that are relevant to them in Wales and to hold politicians to account. And I think in the main, we, we've done that. But I, I totally, I can see why people were frustrated about particular articles. And believe me, when there's a central team syndicated story, which talks about the UK and it's got a Wales online at the top, it, it's frustrating and it's hard, but it's also, um, I think it's very, very much, um, there are the anomalies and very much not the rule. Hey, thank you. So yeah, I've got a question looking at um, how the influence of Scottish independence, how, what role that might play on Welsh independence. How do you see the differences between Scotland, Wales, and how we, we're dealing with everything pandemic-wise? 
I think um, I think Scottish independence. It's it's an interesting one in terms of the dynamic. It's obviously very similar. It's much further along in the process than Wales is. I don't think it's guaranteed that they'll take the same trajectories. And um, I think one thing that's quite interesting is Nicola Sturgeon is in a much better position than Mark Drakeford as the leader of a devolved nation because she can say, "Ah." Oh, UK government done that. That's the UK government. We want to see this UK government. It's it, it, it's it, it fits with her political outlook to see that as an enemy. Um, not an um, enemy is probably too strong. Um, as um, it's a very adversarial way of looking at it. Um, Mark Drakeford is leads a unionist party in Wales, and he doesn't necessarily want to always feed into a narrative that Wales has been shafted. Even though there's been quite a few times I could point to now, um, if anyone was interested in say when Wales has been shafted <laughs> over the last year. Um, um, so I think the the difference in between Wales and Scotland is that you've got two like well it looks like the poll suggests that Wales um, that um, Welsh Labour, the Welsh Tories and Plaid Cymru are going to have all get fairly significant seats in the next election. There's going to be three large parties um, and two of them are unionist. So it, it's not necessarily going to play out the same way. Whereas in Scotland, it, it's not it's not the same. Um, um, how do I think Scottish independence is going to play? It, it, I mean, it, it does, for instance, um, it's an example, isn't it? It's an example that things can be done differently. It's an example that independence can be a thing. But I mean, if I mean, we've tried to uncouple the UK from the EU and that was immensely tricky. Uncoupling Scotland and, Engl and, and um, the UK would be even harder. So even if Scotland does become independent, it might actually not whet people's appetite for independence because... I think benefits from independence, if they come, will not come immediately. I think it will take time for um, things like investments, control of monetary policy to actually have a, an impact. But I'm not going to lecture people at business school about this. So um, uh, I'll leave that there. You said that there were reasons how um, Wales have been shortchanged. Could you elaborate on those? If you're willing to... um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm speaking now with my author hat on because this is more in the book than my Wales Online hat on. Um, the... <laughs> I mean, one one example is the is the five thousand tests a day um, that we were supposed to be getting. Um, there, there there was a deal with Roach, and it it was for five thousand tests a day, and um, it, that was taken that was uh, that was taken by the UK government essentially. Wales did get some of those tests, but Wales didn't get near five thousand test capacity for a very long time after that. Um, and that essentially informed a lot of Wales decision making going forward. Um, there's the issue of staying on tests. Um, the Cardiff City Stadium testing centre um, was um, appeared essentially without the Welsh Government or Public Health Wales being fully across that that was happening. I mean, you might because it was started by Deloitte and um, the UK government, you might argue um what's the problem they've just started a mass testing center in wales um which is which is true uh one thing one issue with that is the systems didn't marry up so in wales they had an integrated system where when you got a test it went into your gp record um it was all the data was held like securely within a i think within a welsh nhs server um don't quote me on that um but um the um, the difference was, and the, but then the Deloitte and UK government system didn't do that. So that's actually, it was those initial things that is now why we have a, um, Lighthouse Labs and Welsh Labs in Wales. Those seeds were laid quite early on. And we saw being what, being dependent on the Lighthouse Labs met back in the autumn. We had people in Cardiff being sent to Inverness for a test um, and, and things like that. So I'm not saying it would have been better if the Welsh government ran it exclusively or public health world would run it exclusively but it made it more complicated than it needed to be and adding complications in a complicated crisis is I wouldn't suggest the most advisable thing to do. What do you consider to be the advantages of our devolved approach through the pandemic? Um, I, I just think in general it's best when decisions are made closest to the people that they affect. I think there's um, a lot of evidence if you empower and fund local government at a very local level that there's there is good governance there'll obviously be waste and stuff but uh, I mean anyone who's worked in any organization ever <laughs> in any sector knows that there's waste um I think I mean we've seen examples of um Wales is different in terms of demographics we've got an older sicker population um we've got large pockets of poverty um which need to 
especially in a virus which kills people in poverty quicker. I think it, being able to tailor approaches to that is is useful. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, there's just very there's very broad reasons why this is good. I mean, you could you can look you can disagree with everything the Welsh government has done during this crisis and still think I think devolution is the best thing to do is the best way to be because um you just disagree with how people are using it like I'm someone might disagree with how the UK government runs but that doesn't mean they disagree with having a democracy <laughs> do you know it, it it's it's the kind of the um party that's leading so I think there's I think essentially having um people um who are closest to um the decisions made closest to the people they affect broadly I think is the most important thing okay last question thanks so much Will um yeah can you give us a glimpse into the future I know it's impossible to do but yeah what's next for Wales for the over the next couple of months from your perspective um, we can't hold you to it but <laughs> I, I, I think anybody in any walk of life at the moment who tells you they can predict the future is a liar and you should treat everything they say with uttermost distrust um I would guess from the thing that's said I'm going to try um I would guess that um, there'll be the virus essentially hasn't changed. It's just well, it's just got more easily spread. It kills people just as easily and it does mutate. Um, I would imagine that the two things which have been shown to keep the virus moderately under control are lockdowns and summer. Um, summer's on the way. Like I can actually see a blue sky out my window right now. It's very it's unbelievable. I've forgotten what it was. Um, cases will stay relatively repressed there are likely to be newer variants because the more cases there are the more there can be new variants we we don't know how um new variants will affect the vaccine there's good signs with the current variants and the vaccines um i would imagine that um we're going to be in for potentially another mass vaccination at the start of winter um in the autumn time um which wouldn't necessarily be be a bad thing it might become part of the day-to-day um it, that the yearly stuff we see with the flu jabs but frankly i'm not an epidemiologist and i i, I would not feel comfortable saying this is going to happen there's going to be a Senate election. Enough, be a Senate election at some point <laughs> I'll, I'll give I'll, that's my, my my hot take so thank you so much that was so interesting and um really delighted to have you this morning thanks for joining us i think we got to about 110 at one point so thanks everyone for tuning in and um see you all soon thanks so much will yeah, bye bye